we continue with our series, Living God's Way and Being Fathers Today, we're going to talk about being a father God's way, fatherhood God's way, uh, that we're following God's pattern. And these things are important for us as fathers to learn, but it's important for us to pass it on down to our children. And what our, what our desire here is to with this whole living God's way concept is to clearly mark out the pathway that God has for us. That we're walking in God's way and that we not get off, we get off the path and we get lost. We have a problem. In my younger days, in Colorado, we would, uh, we had a cabin up in the mountains and as soon as I got my chores done, got wood split and all of that, I was out in the woods. I was up the streams or I was uh, hiking across trails. Well, a lot of times the trails could get grown up or whatever you could get off or, or if I decided to strike out across through the woods, you get in the dents of the, of the trees and you can't see the mountain peak or you've got to get out into clearing to see. But a lot of times I would take a, a knife and mark the trees, <laughs> to find my way back out. It's kind of a sinking feeling when you get in and you're wandering around and I'm not sure where I am or which way I came. Well, we need to have clearly marked trail, clearly marked pathway. God's done that. Jesus has given that to us. So these are things that are found on the path that God has provided for us. It is God's way. He says, follow me. Go this way. Uh, and so all of these things are things that make us Christian. Now, Christian means Christ-like. So I could be a believer, even a, you know, a, a genuine believer. I've truly accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, but have wandered away, and I'm not living in a Christ-like manner. So Christian is Christ-like, so that is, it is acting like, thinking like, having an attitude like Jesus Christ. Not somebody else in church or the pastor, it's Christ. So all of these things that we've talked about are uh, essential steps in being a believing believer, not an unbelieving believer. We've talked about, you know, begins with fundamentally believing in God and what does that look like and what does God look like. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. We talk about a genuine salvation. A commitment to Jesus as Savior and Lord. Okay, that's what Jesus talked about over and over. Baptism. Commitment to, to, to the Lord's church. Being in the Word. Being in prayer. Now, let's be real. We're being on. This is what a Christian is. We are not living God's way if we are not daily in the Word and in prayer. Okay? I want to dispel. I'm going to love you enough to tell you the truth, like we talked earlier about uh, our, our, our giving and other things. It's for our good. He says, try me and see. I just want to bless you. You go my way and you'll be blessed. Be in the Word. I cannot justify when I'm not reading the Word and I'm not in prayer. I'm not going to be following the manufacturer's instruction book. So all these things, basic, you say, I've heard that, I know that. Well, well, then why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we being believing believers? Why aren't we being Christian? So these things are essential. And unless we follow God's pattern and instruction, we're going to get off path, we're going to get lost. I don't mean we're going to lose our salvation, but we're going to get off track and we're going to suffer consequences. Whatever we sow, we're going to reap. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit more later. But the thing is, you may know this, you may have heard it, but I'm wanting to provide things for our children, for our teenagers, for people that come to our website that are seeking God and say, okay, what do I do now? I think I've told you about a young man that I was discipling. I was trying to, I was thinking I was going to lead him to a commitment to Christ, and going through a Bible study and coming to that point, or you know, ask him, would you like to right now commit your life to Jesus Christ? He said, I already have. 
And I really meant business. And he told me his testimony. And he says, I really committed my life to Christ. And I was really excited about it. And they baptized me. And then they just left me alone. And I didn't know what to do. And nobody would have anything to do with me. And nobody told me what the next steps were. And, and I've just been one. I've been miserable all these years. Because all the only friends I had were those lost friends. And I'm doing stuff that I hate and my life is miserable. I don't want us to be there. I want us to clearly understand, yeah, you need to be scripturally baptized. You need to be committed, involved in the local church. You need to, this is how you need to be in the Word. And we need to be discipling others, discipling young Christians. Here's the deal. We can make that decision. We're to live God's way or not. Um, several years back, I organized a deep sea fishing trip. And I was reminded of this because... Uh, a friend's going on deep sea fishing tomorrow and talking about that. I was reminded there's a bunch of pastors and their wives that wanted me to get a deep sea fishing trip set up. Galveston got it all set up. They went and, and I talked to them about because I would get seasick sometimes. So I said, look, do you get seasick? Well, I don't know. I don't think so. I'm, yeah, I get seasick. I said, okay, don't go inside the cabin and don't lay down. Don't sit down. Don't be looking around. Keep your eye on the horizon. Here's some, I brought some lemons. You can suck on a lemon and keep your eye on the horizon, and you'll be okay. They got, before we'd get out, you know, of the bay almost there, oh, I'm going to go lay down. And I said, don't go inside. Don't lay down. You'll be worse, and it'll be a long day of just, yeah, being sick. They didn't listen to me. Oh no, you just don't understand. I need to. I understand. I meant don't go inside and lay down. What did they do? They went inside and laid down, and they're making a mess. And I'm telling, I don't have any sympathy. So you're just like your church members. You complain to your church members don't listen to you, and you're not listening to me. Now this is where we are in life. We can say, oh, you just don't understand. I know better. I don't need to listen to God's. I don't want to need to live God's way, and we end up. Sick and in a mess, right? Because we don't listen. I'm sh going to share these things in all kinds of different areas. Everything from our family and our finances and our work and uh, our relationship, our friendships and all the rest. Uh, living God's way. Well, today we're going to talk about fathering. Being a father God's way. Now... Mentioned foundationally, the basic thing we talked about first was, do you believe in God? Do you believe in God? Okay. Do I get an amen? Do you believe in God? Yes or no? Okay. So, but what God do we believe in? How do we perceive Him? What do you believe about God? You see, our God... We walk into church, even when we go to the Bible, our visual of God is preconceived. And a lot of our image of God is emotional, not rational. What do I mean by that? Well, there's, there's a pretty good book entitled God Distorted. God Distorted by John Bishop. And in his book, he goes into detail about what sociologists and psychologists and researchers and all have, have found that uh, we perceive God to be like the father figures in our life. When we hear the term heavenly father, inevitably our emotional responses or our thinking associates with that word father. And that we have to unlearn that or we have to deal with the facts of the word of God. Now what we believe about God is you say, oh I believe in God but who are you talking about? Even talking about Jesus. I used to ask people a lot, well I believe in Jesus and I would ask which Jesus? Because you just say, use the name. You know, that could mean anything. God? Well what is God like? What do we believe about God? And this distortion about God greatly affects our living God's way. It affects how we pray. It affects how we live. It affects how we even read the Word. We can read right over 
the descriptions of God and the Word of God and not see it because we have our image of God from our father figures. Our earthly father or those that served as father figures, and we have that concept. So when you close your eyes and you hear the word Heavenly Father, what images come to mind? Maybe you like some of these images uh, on the screen. <laughs> you know, is our image of a loving father teaching us, talking with us, being with us, or I'm your father and you're my slave? Or uh, the angry father. Or the father that... I like the one where he's got the kid duct taped up on the wall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, you got the image of the... And you know how many people have told me about how their father taught them how to drink, smoke, do drugs, and all the rest. Or the neglectful father, too busy too wrapped up in their own world, in our own activity. All kinds of images of father. Okay, there can be some difficult things that we as fathers have done. And you know, the, the issue is that subconsciously, and even consciously, our idea of God is molded, and a lot of times by the wrong things that fathers and grandfathers have done. Because the thing is, is that Women, you're just like your mother. Guys, we're just like our father, who is just like his father. We pass down these things, and this is what a father is. This is what a father does. And we've got to take another look at that. Because if this is so, we need to recognize that the spiritual future of our children depends upon how we are as fathers. Now, I know we don't see any of these images except for maybe the one in the top left-hand corner out of our fathers, but need to think about who am I teaching my children that God is as a father? And maybe as a father, we need to unlearn some things and we need to change some things and we need to move from the emotional or the subconscious teaching to making a choice to be like our Heavenly Father. And so, there are about three things I want to throw out at you today. And one is that, number one, we need to divine God by the Word of God. When I say I believe in God, I want to believe in the God of the Bible as defined by the Bible. So how do we get that? Well, we don't if we're not in the Word, right? Living God's way in the Word and finding God in the Bible. We need to understand that and accept it. Secondly, we need to honor, love, understand, and even forgive our earthly fathers. Earthly fathers and father figures. You know, the thing is, we're all doing... You know, I made a lot of mistakes as a father, but I was doing the best I knew to do. I was doing what it, my father did the best he knew to do. He did what he knew to do from his father. And the thing is, is that, you know, and I understand there's some, some really bad fathers or wicked fathers, there's one that didn't try to do, but, you know, forgive and be forgiven. So, we need to understand that concept. We need to embrace and we need to identify, hey, these things my father did, or this is how my father, but that's not how my heavenly father is, and that's not how I should be. Number three, fathers need to have the attitudes and actions like the God of the Bible. In other words, as a father, grandfather, whatever, I need to be like God. Godlike. I need to look at his attributes his character, and I need to seek that as dominating my life. Not saying, well, my dad was like this, and I'm going to be like that, and this is how I'm going to treat my kids. No. We need to understand who Heavenly Father is, and we need to live it. I mean, think about this concept. A father who is or was, father could be past or a uh, number of issues there, but, you know, when, when we as fathers are exceptionally critical... 
and we relate that to our Heavenly Father, and we say, God doesn't like me much. I'm never good enough. He's never going to be satisfied. Or if He's angry, anger dominating, you know, our life. Well, Heavenly Father is mad all the time, and I just need to hide out from Him. It affects our prayer life. It affects our relationship with God, who's demanding. Well, again, I'll never meet God's demands. That subconsciously comes in our minds to deal with all these things in people's lives overall and say, why do you see God that way? Because He's never pleased. He's always demanding. He's weak. Some people see God as weak because their earthly father was weak. What, what is weak? I mean, like... Uh, undependable, unreliable, unfaithful. And so I'm going to come out with the concept, I can't depend on God. He won't help. He doesn't keep His promises. Because that's our concept of God. When a father's a taker, you know, and takers are more than just taking financially, taking emotionally. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. Well, that's our view of God. Earthly father's too busy. Doesn't le uh, listen. Neglectful. It's never there for me. That's our view of God. He doesn't want to get involved in my life. He's foolish. All the principles of Proverbs. We need to understand Proverbs in the relationship of father and son that it shows in Proverbs. But a foolish father, whether a fun-loving fool, a furious fool, a futile fool, a simple fool, all these fools, and sometimes fathers act foolishly. It becomes dominant characteristic. Well, what does that make me feel? God just doesn't get it. He doesn't understand where I live in the real world. On the other hand, if we as fathers are patient, we see God's long-suffering. He gives me a chance. He doesn't get angry at the first drop of things. He's loving. Love is giving yourself without expecting anything in return. And what did our Heavenly Father gave His Son and Jesus died for me? That loving concept to know that my Father my, and my Heavenly Father really loves me. See, it's hard. Sometimes people have never experienced feeling love of a father figure. That's essential for us to get past that by the Spirit of God in our understanding of God. But we as fathers need to understand we need to be that. We need to be wise. The feeling that as children can come to the Father and get wisdom. What's the real answer here? What's God's point of view? We understand God's point of view is wise. So many don't accept that. When a father is giving, cares, is good to me, then it's easier to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father understanding God gives. God says, try me and see if I won't pour out blessings on you. If, if we as fathers are accepting you know, it's a difficult thing. You know, I, I wish I would have learned easier the principles of the spiritual gifts and the personalities because the concept that everybody's not like me, I understood that. My kids weren't like me. You know, you know they had... It was different. That was a bad thing to me. <laughs> but everybody... The truth is, everybody's not like me, and that's a good thing. And I needed to have learned... My children's spiritual gift, and as fathers, you need to know your children's spiritual gift and their personality and understand how they are different and accept that. Accept the fact that they don't see things the same in terms of that personality or that spiritual gift. I don't mean seeing things different as whether we believe the Word of God or not, but it's just, you know, the principles like like someone with a, a gift of mercy is going to be very caring and very uh, uh, sensitive to needs where someone with the gift of declaring the word of God, prophecy, it's black and white, that's going to be opposite. They're not going to understand that we need to be accepting 
that our children aren't always going to live out our plans for them. Or they're not going to be exactly like us. They're, God made them different and wonderfully made. Having a father who is protecting. Who is protecting. He not only loves me as I am in spite of my flaws, but he never leaves me or forsakes me. Now, the reason, you know, I, I want us to think about the reality of that. Look at it in your own life. What issues you have or what things there may be, and what perception maybe you have of God. And maybe some of these things, because of course we as guys, we don't deal with emotions and feelings, do we? Yeah, we've got it all wired down. No, I'm being sarcastic. We're not so. You know, we, We're influenced by all of this, and we need to stop and see how much of this lines up with the Word of God. In order to, to illustrate this, one look over at Luke chapter 15, and uh, the parables that Jesus was talking about, the, what was lost and what was found. In, in Luke 15, 11, he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the young, younger son gathered all together, uh, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all there, arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to be merry. Okay, now we use this passage. We talk a lot about the prodigal. But I want us to look here at the picture of God in the Father. And this is what I believe he's, he's picturing. Because the son came to him and said, I wish you were dead. If you were dead, I could have my inheritance. I want mine. I want to do my own thing. I want to be my own boss. He rejects the Father. Okay? I want to live my way, not God's way, not your way. I want to do my own thing. It's a picture of us as human beings, isn't it? It's a picture of mankind rejecting God. It's a picture in our lives even of rejecting God. We can sit in church on Sunday and sing songs and shake our head at the, at the message and all the rest, but go out and say, all right, now God, I'm going to live it my way. I'm doing my own thing. Don't bother me between Sundays. Okay, we reject God, we reject God's way and said, I don't care what you say in your work, I'm going to do my, I want you to bless me, I want you to give me great blessings, and I want to do what I want to do. So, that was the rebellious, selfish, self-centered attitude of a prodigal. Now, that's an unbelieving believer. That, it, that can be in the life of those who truly are born again and become prodigal. That is, we say, I'm going to live my way. I don't care what God says. I don't have time. I don't have an interest in doing what God said. So, what does the Father do? He didn't condemn him. It doesn't show him correcting him or condemning him or trying to control him. He said yes. He let him go. Isn't that amazing? 
Now think about this. Think about this in the picture of God in our view of Heavenly Father. You say, well, I've gotten away with it. I got to do my own thing. I'm in charge. It's not I God will let us go so far. He will allow us to sow whatever we want to sow. He knows that when we're rebellious, when we're self-centered, when we're proud, He's going to... uh, uh, We're going to have to learn it ourselves. And so, He let Him go. And Father, there's a time when we have to let our children go. Train them in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it, God willing, and we hope and pray. And that's why getting the Word of God in their hearts. But He let Him go. Knowing that that was going to end up being what was best for Him. The only way that He would be humbled enough to learn is to fail in the way. And sometimes by the time, you know, usually what we do is we're growing up and we get to teenage years, especially we start getting that kind of mind and we start wanting to do and then we get out. Now today I don't know how much of that. There's more and more of staying home and wanting to be rebellious and doing all of that rather than going out. But this is the principle. Response of the Father, he said yes. He was giving, patient and wise. And what happened? Reaping. Galatians 6, 7. God's not mocked. Whatever we sow, we're going to reap, right? And He reaped it. Now, there's just a few verses here that talk about it, but there's a lot between the lines, right? Different translations view it differently. He said prodigal living. It was immoral, ungodly, riotous, hedonistic living, and he wasted it all, and he lost it all, and he ended up in the hog pen. Now, being in the hog pen in the Jewish culture was not just a bad thing. That was the lowest of the low. Pigs were not, uh, they were cursed. They were not to be a part of, of life in Israel. And here he is in the bottom of the bottom. So he's reaping What he had sown. Verse 17 is a great verse. It says, basically, he came to his senses. He came to himself. Not all rebellious people come to themselves. And there are people that I know who are professing Christians. They claim a testimony of Christ through their life, and they are still prodigal. They are still rebellious. They still have not come to themselves. They're still not humble. They're still not teachable. But he came to his senses and he said, I'd be better off being a servant in my father's house than where I am. I'm going to go back. And he planned a speech. I've sinned against, notice what he said, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against heaven. You know, that's a principle of when we're rebellious, when we are sinful, you know, it's like Joseph. When Potiphar's wife tried to tempt him, what did he say? He said, I could not sin against God and my master. Right? And so we need to keep that view. But, and that's that association of the father and the son. But reaping rebellion, he came to his senses, and so he goes back home. And what is the picture? We say the father's watching for him. The father sees him a long way off. Then he says, well, just let him, who does he think he is coming back here, Right? Son shows up and said, I told you so. Boy, you're going to pay for it now, right? There's none of that there, is there? A lot of images we have of God. He says, what do you have to say for yourself? No. He ran to meet him, threw his arms around him and hugged him and kissed him. Didn't even respond to the planned speech. Put, said, bring the best robe, bring the sandals, and you know, put on his feet. Let's kill the fatty cat. We're going to have a barbecue. We're going to have a barbecue celebrating the son who was dead. As far as the father knew, he was dead somewhere. But now he's alive. He was lost. And now he's found. Now, 
Is this normally what we think of as the Heavenly Father? Is this how as fathers we relate to things? Are we teaching our children who God is by being like the prodigal's father? Loving, giving, understanding, wise, prudent, compassionate. My son, who is dead, is alive. He was lost, but now he's found. You see what I'm saying? Our picture of what we ought to be as a father needs to come from passages like this. We need to meditate on this and look at the Father. Look at the picture of the Heavenly Father here and look at what we need to be as fathers. You may say, oh, well, my father would never do that. He, I, could hear, I could hear it now. The lecture, I could hear the consequences coming. See, he'd already, the son had already, he'd lost all, everything he had. We don't have time to go to the story, but the older brother, he was upset, right? Why are we having a barbecue for him? I've been faithful here. And the father said, what's wrong with you? You've been with me all the time, and everything I have is yours. He has nothing. Why don't you love him? And be thankful he's alive, and he's come back humbled, and he's learned his lesson. Our Heavenly Father grants us freedom to fail. If I, you know, I, there were times in my life I wanted to do my own thing and walk my own path. And He let me. He let me fail. He let me end up in the hog pen till I'd come to myself. Right? But He loves me enough to know that He has to let me fail. He doesn't control us. Our Father wants us to come to Him and love Him. He wants to throw His arms around and, and wrap around us. But He is not going to force Himself on us. He's not going to control us. He said, if you, don't, if you wish I were dead, you don't want to be around me, you want to reject my way, that's your choice. But He was there for Him, waiting for Him. That's what we need to be as fathers, and that's how we need to teach uh, our children uh, to be. He doesn't turn His back on us. He suffers with us. Don't you know He was suffering all of the time? Suffering, concerned about the pain and the difficulty the prodigal son was going through? You think He was so, I hope He suffers, I hope He really goes through it. No. That's not where He was. He may have been praying, uh, you know, hoping, the desire was that exactly what happened. He would come to His senses. When will we come to our senses and live in God's way? I don't get it. Even as Christians, there's things we're doing in direct violation of the Word of God. Maybe we don't know it because we're neglecting the Word and we're not in there. Or maybe we just know it and we're doing it. But when will we come to our senses? It's never going to work out. God says, live my way and I want to bless you. Our Heavenly Father suffers with us. Our Heavenly Father wants us to choose to love Him. Choose to give our life for Him. Don't get out of our head emotional, irrational stuff and understand who our Heavenly Father is and relate to Him that way and learn from Him and be that kind of a Father. He desires for us to prosper living in His way. And so the key is try to be a Father like God. God loves us unconditionally. 1 John 4.10 not that we love God, but that He loved us. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates His love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And our Heavenly Father loves us. He is always there. Hebrews 13, 5. I will, he will never leave you nor forsake you. We need to be that kind of Father. To be stable, always there. Be loving, giving unconditionally. He provides for our needs. Matthew chapter 5, you know, talks about that provision for our needs, not our wants. Sometimes we as fathers need to provide 
the needs and sometimes what our children need is less rather than needing more but he loved them and provided for them he's referred to as our heavenly father in Matthew in the in the Sermon on the Mount especially in chapter 6 he over and over and over he says your heavenly father we can have a dynamic close loving relationship with our heavenly father but we've got to get out of our our minds and our concepts how we as human beings have messed things up we need to not be that way he teaches us proverbs 3:1 god wants to teach us the way to go and it's for our good not for our bad. we have this attitude you just want me miserable do you ever go you know when i was a teen my kids wanted my my kids my parents wanted me miserable right because i didn't get to do all the things all the other kids got to do right they didn't love me right no <laughs> they 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 loved me and they needed to teach me and they did our heavenly father disciplines us whom he loves he what spanks he doesn't beat us but he gives us corporal punishment my heavenly father spanked me a lot my earthly father spanked me some not as much as my mama did cuz dad was at work more but if mama said when dad gets home you're getting a spank and then you know it was a real problem cuz we were waiting all day and and he could swing that paddle a lot harder i don't know how that worked but he discipline out of love our heavenly father disciplines us for our get not out of anger fathers never discipline in anger always explain why teach them how it grieves your heart how it grieves your heavenly father our heavenly father doesn't rejoice in spanking us looking for us to get out a line to whack us upside the head no it grieves him that we have chosen to rebel to sin and he forgives first john 1 and if we confess our sins He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness and the prodigal came home. And he fell on his face and he said, "I've sinned against heaven and against you, you know, and forgive me." So, my key thought today is, you know, those first three things that I told, we need to have the right perspective on God. And we need to have the right perspective on our earthly fathers. Forgiving them and relating to them in a positive that's hard sometimes dealt with folks that had just deep bitterness all their life up into their 60s and 70s of hatred toward father and mother but the bible says honor father and mother and your life may be long but forgiving so we're all just sinners saved by grace right so forgive our father but then you know and that could be hard And then fathers, we need to be like our heavenly father, the father of the scripture. You need to look in the scripture. This is how I am to be. These are the attitudes I am to have. This is how I'm to relate to my children. Meditate on this passage in Luke 15. So many others where we see the expression of our heavenly father and who he really is. We have these warped concepts because of sinful uh condition of our world. You say what's well, hard? And I'm just that way and I can't get over my feelings toward my father or I can't be the father I ought to be. I'm just that way. I can't deal with my my temper or uh you know, I'm just what I am. I can't change. That's not true. Galatians 2:20 I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. So I can't say, well, I can't be the father or I can't forgive or I can't deal with that. No, cuz I can't. I'm dead though. But Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's where God works in me both to will and perform according to his good pleasure, right? He can change. He can give us forgiving attitudes. He can give us loving spirit. He can make us as dads dads that are more like God. 
earthly fathers who are, by the grace of God, emulating our heavenly Father. That kind of love, that kind of compassion, that kind of, of forgiveness, that kind of wisdom, kind of teaching. That's what we need to be. And all of us need to approve. I, I can't say I am who I am. I can't change. I can't do that. No, I can't, but He can in me. Because I'm dead. And I need to confess myself dead. So His fathers, I give that challenge to you today. Our challenge is to emulate our Heavenly Father. And, uh, and understand that our children's perspective of God will be drawn primarily from the experience and the example of me as father. You notice in that those first little graphics it said something to the effect <sighs> if I need my glasses I can't read it. <laughs> but when our children grow up they will follow our example, not our advice. So we, by example, need to follow the example of our Heavenly Father, and we need to wrap our mind around the teaching of the Word of God to be like the Heavenly Father. I pray.